This week on CrossFeed. A Christian revolution among Muslims in Europe. Texas cheerleaders, let's hear it for God. Take a look inside a Mormon temple. But don't criticize Mitt. Oh, no. Hell no. Oh, yes. Hell yes. Hello, everybody. Welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I'm Pastor Jim Butler at St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts, just outside beautiful Boston. Yep. So this is our um, October 14th episode. Um, this past week, I was at our uh, Ohio District Convention, or uh, not convention, Pastors Conference, and I uh, had a really great time there. Um, you know, it was at... Uh, it was at the Great Wolf Lodge, um, which would have been really great if I could take my family along, but it was down in Cincinnati, and you know, I would have had to pull kids out of school and stuff, and it just didn't work out. So it, it was sort of like, uh, not all that great being there. I mean, it's a nice place and all, but uh, you know, it was, it was sort of disappointing to not be able to take the family so they could enjoy it. So then I couldn't really enjoy it either. But I enjoyed being with my colleagues, and um, and th- the first day especially, we had a really great presentation uh, by a couple of parents that have a gay son, and they talked about their experience and what they learned and um, how to how to deal with a, a child with same sex attraction, and they also talked about uh, how our churches need to be. You know, your church has a sanctuary. And that means it's a safe place, and our sanctuaries need to be safe places for all different kinds of people, regardless of what kind of sins they struggle with. And it kind of echoed some of the things that we've said on this show, but um, it, w- it was really nice to hear it, and I-, I got some insights from it, too. No, we're not homosexual, but we are willing to learn. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad that, that you had a good conference. Ours is, ours is next week, and we're going to be on Christian education by one of the pastors up here he just got his phd and it was on uh, christian education in the parish and stuff so that's going to be our uh, topic and it's just one night this time so we will enjoy our but we always enjoy ourselves i find it a lot of fun getting together with the guys from new england but, uh, so oh let's get this puppy going where should we start here oh Yeah, hey, let's ask the question. Does hell exist? Okay. All right. So, um, this is uh, this is an article from CNN. All right, it was an interview with with two different guys. Uh, one is Frank Schaefer, and the other one is Mark Driscoll. Right. Uh, it is, by the way, this Frank Schaefer is the son of Francis Schaefer, of L- Leo Brief. For those of you who remember Francis Schaeffer from the 1970s and 80s, um, that's interesting because I don't recall Francis Schaeffer having views like this. He did. So, um, it's, I, it's not, got a very different direction than but than he did. The, I had a really hard time with. All right, Frank Schaeffer takes a position that. Um, that it is dangerous to believe in hell. Uh, and he basically uh, com- says, he, he compares anyone that believes in hell to the extremists of 9-11. I mean, he he actually makes, he actually draws that comparison. And I'm like, is that kind of like a Hitler argument? You know, <laughs> you automatically lose. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, he, uh, he, he, I just I had such a hard time with it because of his characterization of God was so unbiblical. Um, he he talks about God as as being, um, you know, anxious to uh, he's chomping at the bit to send people to hell and 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 stuff like that and and that's not the God of the Bible at all, right, Old Testament uh, or New Testament. Chomping at the bit, uh, it's. Um... Oh, what was the other one that really get? Um, uh, uh, um, it's there's a thing about um, fundamentalists are, are are revenge are vengeful. We want revenge. 
Yeah, and God smiles on you if, when you um, when you're a, a Christian evangelical that um, that shoots a Muslim and sends him to hell. Yeah, that, yeah, God smiles on them. Yeah, that, I mean, I just got to kind of wonder, you know, I mean, I, I I think it really he obviously was burned very much by evangelicals somewhere along the line, and he, he, he that was right. that. Thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, this kind of reminds me of uh, I was on a online discussion forum and um, I, I said something about Christianity and something favorable and and somebody just like, completely laid into me and just ripped apart the church and, and it was and I mean this is somebody that I kind of knew. I mean we knew each other on the on the forum and stuff and it was like whoa what was that and you know and I just said look I'm not even gonna respond. Um, to all the venom. Um, but man, you must have had a really bad experience in church and I'm really sorry about that. And, and I said, if you want to send me a private note, I'd be happy to, um, you know, to, to talk to you about that. And he actually did. And, and he said, you know, you're right. I'm, I'm really sorry about that. And, uh, and then he explained to me how he had been involved. His whole family had been involved in the um, ministry of a congregation and stuff and and um it sort of got turned into scapegoats for the uh pastor's moral indiscretions and uh you know it just it it just soured him on the church and um you know so yeah you kind of wonder what happened here um it's just the just the whole idea of of hell as um as revenge i mean it's just it's not in scripture and the other thing is that, you know, he, he points to Jesus as the, he, he takes kind of a Marcion, um, look at, um, and, and he's, he, oh, well, Jesus is forgive them for they don't, don't know what they do. Oh, uh, here, um, since Christianity is my tradition, I can say more about it. One view of God, the more fundamentalist view, is a retributive God just itching to punish those who stray. The other equally ancient view, going right back to the New Testament area, is of an all-forgiving God who, in the person of Jesus Christ, ended the era of scapegoat, sacrifice, retribution, and punishment forever. I'm like, yeah, but he did that by taking our punishment on himself. Right. The very the fact that view he did holds that. that far from God being a rich beat of God seeking justice. God is the merciful Father who loves all his children equally. Well. Okay, well, basically, I mean, he he wants the law, no gospel. I mean, he wants gospel, no law. Right. But, he, know, he, I mean, the fact that he uses the term Jesus redemptive died for every, view. everybody, therefore, you know, no matter what you've done, you go to heaven, which, well, I don't know, personally, why not go out and have a good old time then? Well, you know, and more to the point, if Jesus died for everyone, why did he do it if there's no hell? I mean, that's what it comes down to. He refers to Jesus on the cross and says, Father, forgive them. From what? Right. Save us from what? It, it, if I mean, there's no hell, then who cares? It was If there's no hell, then, then Jesus' death on the cross was a waste. Right. And in fact, in that case, God is even more cruel because he sent his son to die for no reason. Yep. I mean... What I get, people ask me about that, and I, I and I, 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 just, God, you know, I say, well, good news is God sends nobody to hell. Bad news is people choose to do that on their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I said, you know, I go, it's very simple, really. You go through life, and you kind of say, God, I really don't need you. I'm perfectly fine on my own. Thank you very much. Uh, today's gospel reading: uh, the rich young man. Hey, I've kept all these rules since I was a kid. Yeah, really. What, what do you need Jesus for? He's done everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. Then when you die, you find out what that means. No God, no Jesus, no nothing. You, 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 okay, now, now you know what that really means. Okay, that's hell. Conversely, if you have this relationship with God that we have in part, there we shall know in full and be fully known. Ah, uh, then we will see. Then we will be like Him, for we will see Him as He is. Oh, and then we will understand what it really means to have our life with God that we've been seeking to have. That we've been talking about having on this earth. I mean, it's really just a continuation of what's going on right now. Right. Yeah. You know, it, I and I, I really, I'm I'm a fan of Mark Driscoll. Okay, and so he's got the counterpoint here, and he takes the biblical uh, position. All right. And um, 
And 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 I, I've listened to him talk on hell before and, and stuff because his sermons are, are sort of like systematic theology treatises. And he's a sort of modern Calvinist. Um so but he disagrees with Calvin on some things like double predestination. But anyway, um he uh you know, I mean he lays out a pretty orthodox view of hell. Um but I've when I was listening to him preaching on it one time, um, you know, he was talking about the parable of the tenants. And um, and he says, all right, people say that they have a hard time understanding how there could be a hell. He says, me, I don't understand how there could be a heaven. He says, now think about this. God sends his son to live among his creation. What do we do to him? Right? We strip him. We beat him. We mock him. We tear into his flesh with scourges and tear the flesh off of his body. And then we nail him to a tree. We're in trouble. And mock him while he's dying. And, and then how does God respond to that? He writes us into the will. He says, I can understand hell. Hell makes perfect sense. I can't understand heaven. And uh, yeah, he just he really does he he lay, he lays it out very clearly, I think here, uh, and you know, and 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 really kind of just really shoves I think right in Frankie, yeah, okay, Frank Schaefer um, when back when he used to he used to be to produce all his father's movies, and it was Frankie Five um, Productions, and so yeah, you know, I always liked calling it. I always thought he's a grown man; he's going around being called Frankie, uh, so you know. Like, my, my mind, he's still Frankie. Um, but, you know, that uh, amazingly, 13% of Jesus' sayings are about hell and judgment. More than half his parables relate to the eternal judgment of sinners. Jesus talks about hell more than anyone else in Scripture. Amazing, Frankie kind of missed that part. Yeah, well, you know, this is so ironic because if you listen to, um, not that I recommend it, um, uh, what's his name? They wrote The God Delusion. Militant Atheist. Uh, it's, is it Dawkins? Dawkins, yeah. Dawkins points out, you know, he claims, look, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, invented hell. Well, that's not quite true. In fact, Driscoll here quotes, um, Matthew, or I'm uh, sorry, Matthew, um, Daniel, uh, Daniel 12, two says, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. All right. Um, so, no, the, the concept of hell was around in the Old Testament. It's not something new that Jesus introduced. But the point is, is that Jesus talked about hell all the time. Right. I mean, constantly. And, you know, so, no, Jesus wasn't all gospel. He was heavy on the law. You know, even like Jim mentioned the, the, the reading for today with the rich young ruler, you know, um, you know, there he, he stops the guy immediately and says, no one is good but God. I mean, that was the theme of the whole text is no one's good but God. So, you know. And, and it, yeah, and it, it, that, I mean, you take a look at that, that Jesus, the rich young man. I mean, it's all law. There is no gospel. Jesus, mm -hmm. did, Jesus did not tell him, give him any gospel at all. It is, you know, it is, it is hammering home with the law. Yeah. And I've always struggled with that one because, you know, I, I think about what would Jesus elders have done at that point, you know? <laughs> like, wait a minute, you let the guy walk away <laughs> and you didn't stop him and say, but, <laughs> you know, you know and yeah, he, he let him go. So, that's but, you know, like, well, like, because what? he was deluding himself into thinking that I, 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 you know, well, he, he was real honest with Jesus because, well, what else, you know, I've done it all. Mm. Okay. You think you right. have, that's fine. You know, yeah, I mean, he didn't want to hear I, what Jesus I can't tell you say. anything more. Yeah. I'm not going to win this argument, you know. I mean, I've kept all the commandments. Well, you kept them. Okay, dude. You know, you and, uh, you know, and at the end of it, he tried to bring it to home that, no, you have it. Because I, if you really kept them all, if you really love God, love your neighbor, it's everything you've got and follow me. I can't do that. Ah, okay. Now, if he, you know, if he had said that, I can't do that. I can't make that. Then Jesus could talk about, it. okay, let's talk now about, you know, who I am and what I can do for you. But, he, but nope. He, instead, he, he, he chose to walk away. Yeah, he said, nah, no. Yeah, I, I preached on it this morning. It's called Trapped in the Mine. I liked your title, by the way. I really yeah. did. I thought that was a very good, I thought that was a very creative title. Mine was some very obvious advice. I preached on Amos, and I said, you know, I mean, you know, 
this sounds this sounds like a foot, you know football analyst. You know, I mean, what do you need to do in halftime? Oh boy, they need to learn to protect that quarterback in the pocket. They get paid hundreds of thousand dollars for the most obvious statements in the world. You know, <laughs> and how much more obvious do you want than uh, seek good, uh, seek good, not evil, that you may live. Hate hate evil, love good. I mean, come on, this sounds like something that you know, preschooler would say. <laughs> But yet it's very, very deep and has deep implications for our life with God. Ah, well, talking about people then who found themselves going to hell and turned around, this was, I thought, one of the neatest articles. What is going on in East, in, in Germany right now? Yeah, this is awesome. This is so exciting. Yeah, uh, well, and yeah, we've got in, in November, I mean, it's like a month away, um, is, uh, uh, the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. It's always the Sunday right after um, All Saints Day, and um, and so this this really kind of brings to to a head about the persecuted church, but also God working uh, within that church. Right. So, go ahead. so what's going on over in Germany is these um, the Iranians. Uh, and other Muslims who have, who are r- refugees in uh, uh, in Germany, and they are coming to uh, uh, Christianity by the hundreds in Germany. Um, started out in uh, Leipzig, and there was a pastor who uh, was teaching German as a second language using Luther's. The, the Luther's uh, Bible translation, which is very much a basis of a lot of the German language, uh, kind of one of the texts. And these people started coming to Christ- coming coming to faith and being baptized. And more and more have started coming ever since. Um, and it's just, and the, you know, they're baptizing 10, 13, 15, 25. Um, and, and it's just really powerful. I mean, these people, they say, you know, uh, um, how do you know how many uh, are, are really real? They, they're doing being very careful with the catechesis with them. Uh, one person says, um, "What is it? There was a sixty-two question test that they had to take before, or something like that, before they could be baptized." Yeah. Well, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess I look at it and say. Um, how do, how do you know it's real? They're risking their lives. Yep. You know, they're not really, I mean, I suppose in theory, the, um, if, if Eastern Germany's, um, uh, culture is, um, or, uh, economy is stronger than wherever they're coming from, which seems unlikely since, you know, a lot of these guys are coming from these massive oil bearing, um, countries. Uh-huh. No, 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 no. The, the 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 Iranian economy is in the basket is a basket case. Oh, okay. Well, regardless, though the um, you know the to risk your life, you know, for whatever you hope, you know, to gain. Uh, but the, but there still would be considered apostate by the by the Muslims. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, okay. and not only their um. Not only are they in danger uh, from other Muslims, because there's lots of Muslims in Germany, and uh, you know, you you put yourself, you, you it's like painting a target on your forehead, and um, or a dotted line around your neck if you're going to go along with uh, modern Muslim execution practices. But, um, but the to to do that, and um, you know, there's there's easier ways to get ahead financially if you know if that was your goal uh, that's he said these refugees uh one pastor i can't remember his first name last name is martins uh gottfried martins the senior pastor of the church these refugees are taking unimaginable risks to live out their christian faith um his church has grown from 200 to over 900 members uh most of these are the number of Iranians uh, bab- being baptized. Imagine of all places, God chooses Eastern Germany, one of the world's most godless regions, as the stage for spiritual awakening among the Persians. It's just, it's just so cool. Um, 
No, I mean, and there's been some kind of strange stuff associated with this. Uh, people having dreams and um, the thing is what they call it. Um, and this is really cool. And, uh, um, that um, you know, some German clerics speak of a divinely scripted drama that includes countless reports of Muslims who have had visions of Jesus. According to Martins and others interviewed for this article, most of these appearances follow a pattern reported by converts throughout the Islamic world. These Muslims see a figure of light, sometimes bearing the features of Christ, sometimes not, but they instantly know who he is. He makes it clear that he is the Jesus of the Bible, not the Isa of the Quran, and he directs them to specific pastors, priests, congregations, or house churches where they will hear the gospel. Now, I heard uh, uh, um, the, the uh, Uva Simeon uh, Neto, the uh, author of this, uh, on, on a podcast, and he said um, he does not tell them the gospel. He does not say, I am Jesus, I have died for you, I rose for you, believe in me. He, they say, he is Jesus, go to this Lutheran church and you'll hear about me. Or go to this Evangelical Baptist church and you'll hear about me. So they're talking to specific churches. Or yeah, and, and that and that fits with what we would expect to to see too, because right. Jesus has called the church to spread the gospel. Yeah, you know, he he passed the baton to us. Right. And he works through means. He works through his word. Now mm-hmm. the cool thing is now I I talked to uh, got talked to some missionaries um, from uh, different areas uh, in, in uh, from different African countries. And they've also had a lot of Muslim converts. And I said I said something to the get to these guys about this. And they go, Oh yeah, we hear this all the time. So this is this is a very common story. Uh Muslims tell us the story all the time. They've had this vision of Jesus. Um and have been told to come to us to hear to, to, to hear to hear about him and be baptized. So I just thought that was really cool. Now it's interesting. Who's not happy about this? The state church. Yeah, you know, they're they're not uh you know, they're like uh, this is going to interfere with our interfaith dialogues. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, people are coming to faith in Jesus. <laughs> yeah. No. Well it tells uh, you something about the state church. Uh which is interesting. Therefore, says um this person, uh, Schirmacher, and I can't remember who he is or she is, but yeah, whoever this person is says, um, Thomas, okay, chair yeah. of the Theological Commission of the World Evangelical Alliance. Only free churches, such as Baptists or our partner church, the SELK, Independent Lutherans, and semi autonomous congregations report, joyfully report conversions. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, which is, we are aware of faithful, faithful Catholic priests doing likewise, but the Catholics are just as hesitant to release statistics because they don't want to jeopardize interfaith dialogue. So it's more important for us to have these dialogues than it is to... To celebrate the gospel and souls being saved. Right. Yeah, you know, okay, so, so here's, it, it, here's what you gotta do. You gotta decide who you're gonna party with, right? Because, um, you know, these guys wanna party with the Muslims and, uh, and pretend that there's no differences or, you know, try to f- work out things, whatever, okay? Um, but the Bible says that there is, uh, is joy and, and singing in the presence of the angels when one sinner, um, repents. All right. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was preaching on that a few weeks ago and, uh, and I thought about that and I realized it says there's joy in the presence of the angels. All right. Well, who's in the presence of the angels? It doesn't say that the angels rejoice. It says there's joy in the presence of the angels. All right. So who's in the presence, you know, who's, whose presence are the angels in? God's. All right. So God is the one who's saying, hey, celebrate with me. God's the one singing and dancing and, and going, this is so awesome. You guys come party with me. Evan just rocks. Um, the, um, yeah, it, it's just really uh, absolutely uh, – um, now, 
you know, fascinating the way God is working and, and doing this and it's changing. And, um, the other thing is a lot of these are, um, very well educated business people, physicians, scientists, engineers, lawyers, economists, teachers. Um, Iran has suffered a big brain drain as a result of its fanatical religious policies. Um, and I would, agree, you know, I, which I would agree with. Uh, the Iranians in my congregation were all very well educated architects, um, things like that. Yeah, I mean, who wants to stay there? Who wants to stay there? Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, that's just great news. I just think, you know, how cool that God is doing His thing. Yeah. Uh, God is bringing new life to the churches of the Reformation in Germany. It, you know, and when you consider what has happened to the church in Germany, which is really evident by looking at the state church, you know, I mean, the fact that there's a state Lutheran church at all, you know, you just imagine Luther just going, oh, what? That's, <laughs> you know? um, I've never understood that. It was kind of a state church for his day because they had, uh, I mean, Prince Frederick took care of him. Yeah, you know, Fre- yeah, yeah, Prince Frederick. And, um, you know, it was, it was the Elector Frederick and it, it was everything short of a, um, state church. I mean, you know, he, he, he was, um, I mean, later on, I mean, you know, and, and it was, you know, the rule, then, you know, for a long time, the rule was whatever the, the, the religion of the prince was the religion of the people. Yeah. I suppose. But, I mean, you had your distinctions, though, because you had, you know, you had other people speaking out, and they were allowed to speak out, and there were those that followed them, and, you know, so, I don't know, I suppose. What was the Augsburg Confession written to? It wasn't written as a confession of faith to, to, to the Pope, it was written as a confession of faith to Emperor Charles V. Mm-hmm. You know, and Luther went to Emperor Charles to call a, to call a council. Yeah, so, so his, you know, he, he, he developed the two, two kingdom theory, but it was not as distinct as our separation of church and state by a long shot. I suppose. So, uh, so, oh my goodness though, but, but would, do the Iranians have cheerleaders? (laughs) Yes, quite the shift there. Okay. Wow. All right. So there are these Texas cheerleaders in this little Texas town. Um, and I can't remember the I think it's Bullmount is the name of the town, if I'm not mistaken. And wasn't uh, that the name of the town in Footloose? <laughs> but it's the Kuntz, Counts, K-O-U-N-T-Z-E. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. It's Kunst or Counts, whatever. Um, independent school district. Their high school uh, had giant banners that had Bible passages on it, like "I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me," or some other ones like that. And the um, and the uh, uh, um, Anna Arthur, Gaylor and her Freedom from Religion is, Foundation. Is that of course what. Annie Gaylor and the Freedom from Religion Foundation stepped in. Friend, yeah, Annie Gaylor um, said, no, they can't be running through these banners that have these Bible verses on them. No, no, no. And for some reason, you know, these people from Wisconsin have nothing better to do on their minds than go through this, this school district. In Texas. In Texas, right. Um. Yeah, it's Counts High School. That's what it is. And so, well, actually, they didn't even sue. They wrote them a letter and said, you shouldn't be doing this. And so um, the Counts School District said, nope, they, you can't do it anymore. Uh, now, partly, it might have been partly just smart enough uh, to say, we don't want to um, spend the money on the, law, the lawsuit. It's e- easier just to ban it than it is to spend, you know, this money. Mm-hmm. But it does the... the uh, cheerleaders went out and got a uh, uh, lawyer from the Liberty Foundation, Liberty Institute, which is uh, a religious freedom advocacy organization. And uh, guess what? 
Um, and they got a judge, and the judge uh, put a stay on that ban till he heard an actual trial. And uh, he says, uh, well, he still hasn't made up his mind, but he just granted – last Thursday, he granted another two-week extension. So uh, he's got a, a – a, a, or did – what day was the uh, – okay, October 4th, he granted a two-week extension. So they've got another – to this Thursday, the 18th, uh, and then he'll, I guess, make his final ruling. Um, actually, I'm on the side of Annie Gaynor in this one. Well, okay, so first of all, um, it really irritates me when, when people take scriptural uh, Bible passages out of context. And and so the to have, uh, you know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, I, I don't think that means winning a football game. You know, well, the other ones is let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know he's thinking about football games there either. Yeah, I, so that that bothers me to, you know, those are those were metaphors. Uh, St. Paul was big into sports and whoever uh, wrote the uh, epistle to the Hebrews used a lot of sports references, which um is one of the reasons that many people think that Paul or somebody who was close to him wrote it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I really, I, that just irks me when people take that stuff out of context for their own purposes. Um, and then to have the guys run through it and tear it apart, like what kind of message does that send? <laughs> oh, the Bible. <laughs> Yeah, now the um the their lawyer, the girl's lawyer's view is uh, okay, well you could you well know, the school district says, Okay, you can hold John three sixteen up at you know, out in the at the audience, that's perfectly protected. Um but this is different. The um cheerleader the the cheerleader's lawyer is saying, um the school district does not pay for any of the materials, the cheerleaders do. They don't even pay for the cheerleader uniforms. The cheerleaders do. Um, they're not praying. They're displaying a Bible quote on a banner. Um, it is uh, their, therefore, it's their expression of their religious view. Uh, therefore, it's protected. Uh, the prayers. Nobody's coerced into a participation. Uh, you know, you can close your eyes. You can. Um, you know, you, you know, the, the, you know, football player doesn't have to run through it if he doesn't want to. Well, if you do, you can even wait till it's after you know, go to the end of the line and wait till it's ripped in two. <laughs> yeah, it usually doesn't last more than two or three guys. I go to our schools, um, where they don't have Bible passages. It's just like beat the other team kind of stuff, uh, and lasts about two, three players and there's nothing left of it. Yeah, I like the this school district's lawyer. We want to make it clear. No one's hostile to religion here. The superintendent is Christian. Every member of the board is Christian. They believe the messages are good. If it was up to them personally, they would like them shown. Um, you know, my view is that this, this is a school-sponsored event. You know, therefore, um, you know, it's for the, and the, at that point, the cheerleaders are representing not themselves; they're representing the school, and what you know. And to have a sign like that, you're this, you're saying this is what the school represents, and this is what the school is um, teaches. Oh. Yeah, you always have to look at this from the perspective of what if it was, what if they had a quote from the Quran or from the Book of Mormon or you know or something like that. If it was a school in Utah and they wanted to have a Book of Mormon quote, you know, uh, would you be okay with that? You know, and yeah, I think about that and I go, I, yeah, I'd, I'd have my misgivings about that. Uh, that would make me uncomfortable um, as a Christian and. So, so if, if that makes me uncomfortable and, um, because it, it seems like 
there's an endorsement of, of that particular viewpoint, um, then that means that, you know, the other way around the, the side that I like, um, is also being offensive to somebody else, um, in, in a way that's inappropriate. So, yeah. Yeah. Every once in a while. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, and that's, you know, the, the, um, the Council from the Liberty Institute um, says the Supreme Court said more than 40 years ago, and many courts have repeated ever since, the students and teachers do not share their constitutional rights to free speech when they walk through the schoolhouse gates. You know, and, and I was thinking about this. Okay, so here's the difference, right? Now, if a football player wants to wear a cross necklace, that's his personal expression of faith. If he wants to do like a Tim Tebow thing and put little like John 316 things or something like that on it, that's his personal expression of faith, right? But the big old banner that everybody runs through, that the that the team, the cheerleading squad, work together to to put it together, and and you know, yeah, you can you can see there's a difference there. Right. Well, the other thing you can uh, uh, argue is, um, you know, schools have the right to limit the free speech of students. They can edit the school newspaper. Um, they can. Um, you know, students have been uh, suspended for comments and articles put on Facebook, things said on Twitter that are not representative of the school. That, 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 you know, they're, they're, you know, would I agree with that in college? No, I think college is different. But within a high school setting, you know, there are, you know, some slightly different rules. Um, you know, I don't think uh, a, a college has a right to edit a newspaper at all. But the um, oh, but, those are adults for the most part. Yeah, it's right, a but different. It does. So, uh, you know, I I don't want I don't want to agree with Annie Gaynor, but I guess even a broken watch is work right twice a day. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, I'll give her that. So, speaking of Mormons, we're going to end with a couple Mormon stories. Um, Go. Oh, let's 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 start with the the Mormon blogger. Let's go there. Okay. All right. So, um, oops, I tapped on the wrong thing. Uh, David Tweed. I think that Tweedy T W E D E. Uh, he's a Mormon blogger, and um, and he is, d- depending who you listen to, uh, possibly going to be excommunicated, but possibly not. Um. He uh, lives in Orlando, Florida, and he's the managing editor of independent website mormonthink.com. And um, he's accused of apostasy, and uh, so he may be facing excommunication. Uh, there's now on the one side, I think that there um, that the Huff Post is is emphasizing something that that they really uh, is a stretch, and that is that he's criticized Romney. Right, uh, but it doesn't sound like this has anything to do with Romney. Um, at least from you know what I'm seeing here, uh, and even Tweed says that it's not about that. Um, now he says, uh, now he said, now he said, he wrote on his blog saying he felt in my gut that his political writings were part of what got him into trouble. Uh, yeah, but there, there was idea. something else. Wrote my blog may have treated the church unfairly. So, yeah, but he says he didn't even know really. But you know, he, he's he's but he's one of the arguing is that it's you know at least he did argue at one point that you know it was some of his remarks about uh, uh, that Romney. So here's the thing about this website, MormonThink.com. Uh, if you check it out, it's kind of interesting. Um, the former managing editor resigned because of pressure. From his local um, stake, uh, is uh, we'd call it. Would be like a circuit, wouldn't it? Uh, no, it's more like a local church. Okay. Yeah, the steakhouse, the local church. Okay. All right. So, um, but he was. So because all right, part of it was they had some stuff on there about temple ceremonies. That is the sacred stuff. All right. Mormon, the way Mormons explain it, they say it's not secret, it's sacred. 
right? And so we don't share it with those who aren't Mormons. So, okay, and I kind of understand that. Okay. So, um, and they had some stuff up there. And, and so under pressure, they took this, that stuff off the site, right? It's not like there aren't a million other places online where you can get information, uh, detailed information about all of the Mormon temple rituals. All right. It's out there. So it, to me, it seems kind of goofy to try to hide it. Um, hello, there's an internet, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, uh, but th this whole website is really, it's about all the various objections that people have, uh, to Mormonism and it's run by Mormons. Okay. These, these guys, they believe this stuff. Okay. They, they are, you know, card carrying or whatever, you know, um, what do you call it? Temple garment wearing, you know, uh, Mormons. And, um, and so, and, and so they're not trying to make a mockery of the church. They're trying to defend the church, but they're saying, look, there's certain things that uh, the Mormon church has not, there's questions that haven't been answered. And, um, and so what they do is they invite, okay, so here's this, this point of contention. Um, and, uh, and I mean, when it comes to the Mormons, there's plenty of different things, uh, everything from the, um, the, the, they call the lost 116 pages. Um, and, uh, where, when the translation quote unquote was being done, um, the guy that was doing the writing, his wife stole the pages from it and said, do it again. Then we'll know that it's for real if it's as, if you're translating off of plates. And Joseph Smith came up with a um, an excuse um, not to do it. Okay, and there's and there's all kinds of different stuff like that. Uh, oh, the the eyewitnesses, all of them later on said, uh, "Well, we wis we witnessed it with the eyes of faith." Uh, oh, so in other words, you're not an eyewitness. You believed what he told you, um, and. Uh, you know, and, and so basically what they do is they've, there's all this stuff and they say, so, um, here's, here's the, um, the question and they allow somebody who's, uh, a sort of a practicing Mormon, um, to answer the question. And then they allow someone who disagrees to answer it. And they say, here's sort of point counterpoint. You decide, right? Which is honest. And again, there's an internet. You you can't hide this stuff, right? And so they're just putting it out on the table and saying, "Let's deal with this stuff," you know. But but let's be honest and allow both sides to speak because they're going to speak regardless, you know. But let's put it together. And um, so yeah, the previous guy uh, ended up just um, uh, resigning. Uh, not just as the managing editor, but he actually left the Mormon church um, because he just got so fed up with it. It was just so ridiculous. He said, forget it. I'm out of here. Um, and he's no longer a Mormon in good standing. Um, I don't know, you know, whether his beliefs, where they are. Um, but so now, you know, we've got David Tweed who uh, he's dealing with the same thing because he just picked up the ball. <laughs> so basically, yeah, I mean, you know, and this is, there's, there's always this question about is the Mormon church a cult, right? And I would contend that any church, any organization that hides what they believe and teach that at least that is one of the marks of a cult. That it depends, depends how you define the term. Right, right. You know, and, and, and I don't I don't think that you can that there's like here's your criteria, you know, um and and if it fits any of these criteria then it's a cult. Okay. But rather um like I saw it uh a list one time and it sort of said the more um the more of these criteria your organization meets the more 
cult like or the more the you know more of a cult you are you know and because there's certain things that uh you know where well uh, Christians have a charismatic leader his name is Jesus uh, happens to be the son of God which that's one of their things is if your leader claims divinity you know um he didn't just claim it he proved it but uh, yeah, that's another story. But so, but this sort of thing, I, I keep wanting to think that that the Mormons have sort of moved past all that. You know that hello, there's an internet. So stop trying to keep things secret. Stop trying to cover things up. Right? Just deal with this stuff and and be honest. And it's like they're still trying to cover it up. And and I don't understand why. Uh, that is life. Speaking of things they hide and things they don't want people to see, and that, of course, is the inside of their temples. Now, it's amazing. I didn't realize how quickly they're building these little puppies. I mean, there used to be very few, and now they just dedicated their 139th uh, temple. I didn't know so, there were that many. I didn't know there were either. They're, 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 they're going up by housing developments. Um, and uh, anyhow... Um, so it, they, I don't know when they were supposed. To, so they just finished one in Brigham City, Utah, which I don't know even sure where it is. Uh, but but they had a six week open house period for this, and this little town of eighteen thousand, four hundred thousand people flooded in to take a look at it. In, that inside. was good for the local economy. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, but uh, 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 the temple, because nobody can go through uh, the temple except once it's dedicated, except for people on a temple recommend, uh, and it's for their go um, uh, well, for their eternal wedding, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and to what takes place there, and uh, so it's uh, a chance then when we get to, to go through it, and that's about it. Now, this article was written um, by John Turner, who apparently is a Mormon. He wrote a book called Brigham Young, Pioneer Prophet. Um, and uh, and he uh, teaches religious studies at George Mason University. Uh, I thought it was interesting that even in here, he covers up certain things. But there's sort of where he like almost gets to a point and then he stops. Um, like for instance, talking, mentioning the wedding, um, he, he talks about, uh, according to Mormon teaching, all people once existed as spirits in the presence of a heavenly father, then came to earth in bodily form. After experiencing both the joys of creation and the trials of earthly existence, nearly all attain one of three levels of heavenly glory. In order to attain the highest celestial realm of glory, a man and a woman must have been baptized as Latter-day Saints and be sealed to each other in marriage. The eternal nature of the family is at the very heart of the Mormon belief. Kneeling across from each other at an altar and with mirrors behind the man and woman, couples can see their lives together stretch into eternity. Okay, what he doesn't mention there is that to attain as is what this celestial realm of glory is. By celestial, they, they mean out in space that you become the god and goddess and goddesses because they still have uh, polygamy in a... Um, it, it's still part of their teaching. They just don't actually practice it um, in countries where polygamy is illegal. Um, but they still seal people through the ceremony, uh, m- multiple women to one man. And um, so what they don't say is that then you then become gods of your own planet and that, um, that, uh, Elohim, uh, God, who they would say is God, the father, um, used to be the God on his planet, the planet Kolob, which is a lot like Kobol, which was the home planet of the, People in Battlestar Galactica. No coincidence. 
Yeah, um, no coincidence at all. Uh, so, so I thought it was interesting how, yeah, he he kind of he starts talking about it. Like, sounds really good, but they're like, oh wait, stop. <laughs> We're not going to say anything more about that. <laughs> stop, hard and see. So, you know, I don't know if, if anybody ever gets a chance. I would love a chance to walk through one of those temples. And and I know that I'd be listening to all kinds of propaganda and, and stuff like that. And, and I think it's it's more the idea that oh, this is like the secret thing, and and you're getting kind of privy to this secret thing, which obviously you know it's like once they shut the doors and and stuff, you know, then they bring out all the 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 sacred stuff they don't want you to see. But um, but it's it, it's you know it's it's interesting. I mean because I mean Mormonism is an interesting religion, and they've got great stories. I, I consider it to be absolute fiction, okay? But they're great stories. <laughs> you you have to you you just have to really you know um, suspend disbelief on a lot of stuff. You know there's oh okay so. You know, you think of it as like fan, like Bible fan fiction, <laughs> you know, and, uh, because, you know, you've got stories in the Book of Mormon about, um, you know, these people riding around on horses in the Americas before the Spaniards brought the horses over. Um, and you've got these ancient civilizations for which there's no archaeological evidence for. Unless you you go with the explanation that one Mormon missionary told me, well, you know, you've got the Lamanites, you've got the Mayans, the Mayan. <laughs> I'll never forget that. That was so funny. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, so but they're interesting stories. The whole, the whole idea of you know God coming from another planet. It's it's a little bit too much Star Trek Five, but you know. It is what it is. Or, but it's not necessarily what it claims to be. Um, so, so yeah, you know, I, I, I suppose that at this point, uh, those editors from Mormon think can, are still allowed to walk through that temple. Both of them. It would be fun. I would agree. Just get an idea. Hey, that kind of brings us to the conclusion for tonight uh, on this April, October 14th episode. Um, if you have any comments, thoughts, questions, uh, please email us at podcast at um, crossfeednews.com. You can also um, leave us a note on our Facebook page. Matter of fact, uh, we did get a story uh, that somebody wants us to do. Uh, yep. And we'll do next week uh, through our Facebook page. Yeah, and uh, Rice. I can't remember what the story's about offhand, but uh, it's actually kind of a follow up on a story that we did a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Anne Rice, the author of Interview with a Vampire. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. Kind of following up on Anne Rice. So we'll we'll do that next week. Mm-hmm. And so we're always interested in your comments, thoughts, other things. Uh, of course, it will help if Dale will finally get these messages, these, these things edited and put out. It'd probably be easier for people to make comments then. Yeah, sorry about that. I I will get them out there. Um, probably not a lot of editing, um, just to get them out there. Uh, see now, you see, well, see that's what you should have been doing during your pastor's conference when you know certain uh, author, translator, synod presidents who will remain nameless uh, or were speaking. You know, you could have, you know been doing something more interesting. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, it's a little more obvious when you've got um, earbuds in, um, <laughs> um, as opposed to just, you know, keeping uh, you know, sketching pictures on a notepad. Oh well, you see, you just sit in your um, room and do it. You don't. You just ignore the guy completely. You don't even go down. Well, you mean you actually attend sessions? Uh, yeah, most of them. I have all of them. You're radical. <laughs> I was one of our guys, and he was at the. He was sitting there during the conference. I go, "What are you doing here? You you, you always sit. You, you're always out on the golf course." And I says, "Yeah, I know, but I'm working for 
Uh, I'm on duty for the ch- chaplaincy, and the Navy's paying for it, and so I actually have to attend. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, people, we'll talk to you later, uh, and hope to see you next week. Yep. Take care. God bless. God give you a wonderful week in His grace. Yep. Good night, everybody. God bless. Thank you.